Dear Heavenly Father, I, again, I want to thank you so much for the time that we have spent here and this week. Thank you for your love. Father, thank you for your forgiveness that you bestow upon us each day. Kind Father, I thank you for Jesus. I thank you that you're not finished with any of us yet. Yes. That's mighty good news because we are recognizing that we, we mess up and we sin and we rebel so many times. Father, we, we thank you for your forgiveness and Lord, we just ask that you will help us to know how to forgive others. We ask for the anointing and unction of the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So as you can see, our topic this morning is forgiveness. That's a, actually a very, very big topic, and it's very, very difficult to do, at least for us humans. It seems for God it's a natural thing to do, but for us humans, it's very difficult to do. And he, saw, he, and he said, Who told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? And the man said, The woman who thou gavest to me with me, she, she gave me to eat of the tree, and I did eat. And the Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that thou hast done? And the woman said, the serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. We come back to this text more than once because it's kind of the foundation of everything is in Genesis 1 and 2 here. But you can see early on that um, the man is blaming God. So there's, there's already early on blaming God, blaming the woman, woman's blaming blaming the serpent, which yes. is in a way blaming God for making the serpent, right? So already there is a great need of God's forgiveness right off the bat. And the fact that he came to them and w w was talking with them indicated that already he was offering forgiveness. Searching them out. He was searching them out. And I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And we recognize that this is the first promise, really, of a Messiah, here in Genesis 3.15. So God is saying he is going to provide the forgiveness. He's going to provide the, the, the way in which we can be restored to rest, re, re, restored and reconciled to God. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. It's mighty good news to me, and I hope it is to you, that in Christ we can be clean. We can be <coughs> forgiven. We can be totally reunited and reconnected and reconciled to this great God of ours that we rebelled against and so often still do. So we're going to deal with um, in-law challenges this morning. We're going to um, deal with that as a jumping off place for forgiveness is what we're going to do. All of us face situations in our marriages that put stress on on us and and my parents had in-law challenges and since they have a story to tell we ask them to, um, to prepare a video clip which which they did and some of you may relate to this and some of you may not because you have a good relationship with your in-laws um, I would also say uh, this is not just talking about marriages. And if you are listening, you will know that all of us have people and situations that we need to forgive. It may not be our spouse. 
Many times it is our spouse because that's the closest one to us. But many times it's others who have hurt, others who have done things, some of which, which are kind of out of our control. But we all have things to forgive for, and this is a high calling of, of our Savior to forgive. And so this is applies to everybody this morning. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. The issue turns on this text. Leaving parents and sticking to your spouse is an incredibly important choice. And um, we're going to be looking at the at the folks' video in just a moment, and there are some things to be watching for. And is what number one of them is is um, is Christ this a good thing or a bad thing? And number two, how can the sacred circle of marriage be violated? Number three, at what age does obedience to parents stop? In the context of this verse. Genesis 2, 24. Just give us a moment to set the DVD up. Number one, is crisis good or bad? Number two, how can the sacred circle of marriage be violated? Number three, oh, I may be going too fast. Sorry. Number three, at what age does obedience to parents stop? Um, be, before we start this, my, my parents um, knew each other from the time that my mother was in the fourth grade. So they had known each other for a long time and then finally got married. And um, w when the folks did this, video clip, they were both in their 80s. So I think we're ready. Are we, are we in your way? Can you see over us? In the first, if you want to read this text from Genesis 2.24, there shall... Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. That's from the Old Testament. From the New Testament, in Ephesians, it talks about marriage, and Ephesians 5, 21 to 31. And verse 31 says, For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife. Marriage was ordained by God, and it establishes a new sacred circle in the family and the community. No one else belongs in this sacred circle. Well, how does, or rather, what does leave and cleave me? One of the big questions. One way of the, it says leave mother and father. Leave to your wife. And what we've discovered is if you don't really leave your parents, you never really cleave. How can this sacred circle be violated? Parents who are quoting, children, obey your parents. The Lord, for this is right. You're old enough, actually, to be married. You're adults. You are no, no longer children. So this cancels out this command. Well, I think it does for, for adults. This is talking about children that come up later. We also have some parents who quote, honor thy father and thy mother. And they basically are saying, you pay attention. Honor a parent does not mean obey. 
You take care of your parents, you honor them all of your life, but you don't settle for their agenda for your life. And being a, a good citizen anywhere in the world is honoring our parents. That's right. And the guidelines must be established. We make a mistake when we don't put these guidelines out and communicate them carefully and clearly. And what are some of the warning signals? Number of this couple, all of the weaknesses of this inner circle. Our struggle was, it seemed to me like we had two heads of this family. You were the head of the family. You loved me. Your dad was also the head of this family. So it, it brings about divided loyalties. That's true. If we live long enough, tell me what happens. Well, we'll become in-laws. <laughs> the very place that we used to be in, now we're there. That's right. What, how did you struggle? What was your struggle? With, with, my, with, with our children? I had a hard time. We had invested so much of our life with our own children. And to see them go. But the kids had always joked and told me, Mother, you are the F-O-W. Found the wisdom. And I said, I won't be able to stop giving advice. Will do is give you leave to ignore me. But when that really came about, that was not too easy. And I kept thinking about this leave and cleave and not interfering in this. I think it's so important to remember the new sacred circle. When we were first married. We wanted to go to the river and hike around. Your mother said, oh no, Dad wouldn't like that. We'd often done that when we were young. I mean, I've been on my own since I'm 16 and now I'm Dad wouldn't like it for us to go do this. Boom, and Dad put on his sing voice. With special emphasis on it clobbered me. Well, I, I think we'll tell a couple of stories about what happened. We, we go now 14 years. Fast forward 14 fast years. Fast forward 14 years. And you can't go back to the mission field. We have been there. Because of malaria. And so we took over his nursing home. We had two of them. My dad was a physician and always wanted to be have a hospital. So this is the nearest time, nearest city got to it. Well, and I might add at this point, he had had five administrators in two years. So you were a pretty welcome sight when you agreed to do this. Some of the staff would come to me and say, Doctor doesn't want us to go to you if we have a problem. He wants us to come to him. And I told them. He said because Harold doesn't know anything. Oh, that's right. And for a wife to hear that kind of thing about her husband. I told them if it had to do with a medical problem, that he knew more about that than I did that they could go ahead and come to me. Other problems. When I saw Dad, I, I talked to him and I said, Dad, you don't think that I'm capable. I'm happy to leave. Changed his tune. He did, and he said, that I, I want you to stay. And that staff member misinterpreted what I said. He 
and they had misinterpreted. Later, he caught me in the business in the basement and said, if we could get rid of Nelma, everything would be fine. He said, how can we get rid of Nelma? I was seeing through so many of these things. This, this little fire under me, and I told him, we are not getting rid of Nelma. He hadn't been as good a Christian as he was. He would have been gone a long time ago. This statement really surprised me. You know, it surprises me that it surprised you. All of their nonverbals had been so rejecting, and I was catching those. They would tell you that they loved me. Right. When I what I learned from this was uh, leave and cleave. Father and your mother learned about the sacred circle where no one could, could get into. Not our children, not our parents, not our friends. And I also learned that well, I knew this. life was my most important person. My life. But you see, honey, I didn't know that. If I to the line and said, I'm going, just stay with you both. We didn't know that I would stay with you. Because if you left, I would have left too. And that was one of the of the griefs for us. We misunderstood this whole thing. We both misunderstood the leaving. Well, I, I began to understand even please really understand what it was talking about. That I was to do everything in my power And if we don't get an understanding of the, this basic principle that God has laid out in His holy word, we're in real trouble. And we know about that kind of trouble. That's right. We have d divided loyalties. Often causes. Telling you these stories not to insult my parents, but if at all possible to help someone else. They died in two thousand fourteen. Mama died in 2014, and Daddy died in 2015. This in-law thing had a lot, a, a, a huge impact on, on them. Richard, you've just seen this for the first time. <laughs> sure, we're going to come to some stuff, too. <clears throat> yeah, we're... Mom and Dad learned an enormous amount, and they did, and, and they did a lot of changing. But one of the things that happened is and that Mom dwelt that. on the problems. You're, you're, you're going to talk about that, yeah. but I want to just hit this. Yeah. yeah. Mom dwelt on the problems with Grandpa so much that she became like Grandpa. Yeah. And yeah. ending ended up treating Melody very similar to the way that she was treated. So this is something that, that you all need to, to um, be careful with as you're, as you're leaving and the cleaving. It would have been so much better if we had been smart enough to take care of the problem early on, just like what Melody said that 
happened with our daughter. If you, if you, if you set the right boundaries initially, it's much easier to do than after the habits are already formed and the, and the negative has already gone on for years and then you try to break it, yeah. then you've got a real fight. Much more difficult. And I would say that in, in a situation like this, it is the responsible of the, it's the responsibility of the child, first of all, to protect their spouse from um, the the parent that is being. Um, if it's but, a wife's, but, if it's a wife's parents, then it's her responsibility to confront them. To, if it's a husband's parents, it's his it, responsibility. It, it, the, the, um, if they are unable to do it, them, particularly if they're unable to to do it themselves, so. Anyway, we're going to talk about um, part a lot of, of this stuff. Part, part, but if 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 you guys want to, well, part of the problem too was that she didn't do some of these naughty things in front of me. Yes. So I had to take my wife's word that yeah. it was happening, and I didn't see it. Yeah. So how do you deal with that? And I think the same thing was happening with you, Marlon. Um, you know, some of these, these zingers. It wasn't so bad with, with, with not, you all. Not as much, no. Um, not as much. Somehow... Not, not the in-law portion. Correct. Yeah. Somehow mom... mom um, Most of it happened one-on-one, on one, not when yeah. the rest of the pe other people yeah. were around. She, she didn't... I, don't, I think she knew she couldn't cow me as much. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> well, and, and Melody was learning, and yeah. so was I. And all I didn't, sort of I didn't yeah. know... And um, Melody just reminding me here, Mom did say at one point, oh, and she said it only once, and I will give her credit for only saying it once, but she shouldn't have said it. It's all right, it's all right. But she said, um, if you decide to get a divorce, I will support you. Oh, no. So... Um, this has brought up a lot of stuff here. Yeah, it has. This is the first time I've seen this, and, this video. Yeah, yeah. And, and so uh, I just wanted to kind of... Brought up a lot. Kind of um, say, the Bible talks about under the third and fourth generation. Talk about that too. And it can, yeah. it can end up being passed down. And yes. the Bible says, by beholding yeah. you become changed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Talk about that And too. so... You can be beholding good and it'll change you towards the good and you can be beholding evil and it will change you towards the evil. And so if you end up, end up just... Um, this was the, kind of the theme of mom for some time here about this relationship with, yeah. with yeah. grandpa. Yeah. And it again... Became, it became what we call here and we're going to share in a few minutes. It came as an obsession with her. Yeah. Yes. And, and yeah, what, what we're wanting and to do now... I, I, I want to say one, one more thing. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the two people that, that uh, end up making peace before they died was my mother. That's what we talked about that. Too. And Melody's mother. These are the two narcissists in our, in our family, both of our mothers. Yeah. So we've had quite an interesting um, yeah. go with it. Okay, I'll... Okay, so the question here, just after watching the video, and I, and I I I just um, I appreciate the fact that w we were wanting to be very careful with this and not implicate the two of you um, unless unless you chose to. We were going to say a little bit but not a lot, and you have said a whole lot more, and, and that was your place to do, not ours. So I appreciate it. I, I want to say something about that before, and, and I think Melody might, might respond to this, and I'm, my guess is that, that we have a very different view on this, um, I, I would say from um, my perspective that we are all narcissists. It's on a scale. To, on a scale. Part of being a narcissist to be a human being. 
It's self We're all about ourselves. About me. We're all incredibly selfish, self absorbed, and we're defending ourselves and not taking responsibility for our own behavior. That's part of the, the human condition. Human condition and the sin problem. But when you go extreme, but then there we call are. That, but then the, there is there are levels of that, and and then there becomes the the clinical narcissist. Yeah. We all are born thinking after our own self. Yeah. So yeah. narcissism is character characterized as selfishness and yeah. looking out for your own self first. But narcissistic personality disorder, which is cl uh, the clinical term for yes. what a lot of people say, oh, they're a narcissist. They might just have strong narcissistic characteristics like most presidents and CEOs of companies. It doesn't mean they are a clinical narcissistic personality disorder. So what that is, is that when somebody has had severe, typically severe emotional trauma between five and eight years old, yes. the brain shuts off the empathy center in their frontal lobe in order to cope and survive with severe emotional trauma, whether it's physical abuse, emotional abuse, fear, tra whatever trauma, five to eight typically. So when that empathy center gets cut off, there is no electrical function to that now for the rest of their life. So they don't have empathy. They have a deep sense of worthlessness, which comes out as being bombastic yeah. or trying to get people to admire them. But deep down, they have a deep sense of worthlessness. And it is, okay. it is very sad. But Thank it comes you. off with people as no empathy. And so they have a clinical problem that is a narcissistic personality disorder. And that's that's not fixable because the electrical function, which is scannable, doesn't come back like somebody in a wheelchair who wants to walk but, but can't. And the, the narcissist doesn't want to have empathy because they, they don't know about it. Yeah. So that it's, a, it's, a, it's a terrible situation. And to have apologies later in life from somebody like that, it is straight miracle. Miracle. And, okay. And, 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 and I would questions? say very much say that 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 it is impossible um, for a narcissist to change apart from the miracle of God. A miracle of God. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Let, let, let's get back this Are video. Are going to have questions at the end? Yeah, uh, let's save some of the and, questions and for the end if possible. Uh, we, we'll have some comments in the middle here, and we're going to ask some questions now, um, and I want a response from these. Um, is just just a quick response. Is crisis good or bad? Yes. Yeah. It's both, isn't it? In fact, the Chinese character for crisis and opportunity is the same character. So a crisis can be an opportunity for growth or it can be negative. It depends on how you relate to it, right? And this, the, the, the crisis that my parents went through with the um, problems with the, the in-laws, this actually catapulted them into uh, um, family life. Which they did a tremendous amount of good in family life. They did. But they, they, they had a blind spot in, in certain areas of their own family. And they, they traveled all over the world um, being... Um, a huge blessing yes, to, much, to very many, much many so. people, but they did have a, a, a blind spot, you know, and um, there's the expression that we are all wounded healers. Yep. Yeah. We all are. What are, all what, of are us. what are indicators that the crisis was coming to a head? When you watch this video, what, are, what was the indicators that Christ, the crisis was coming to a head? In this case, Grandpa was, was controlling and dominating the children in their home, which she had no right to do, what was the indicator as it started to come to her head? What did Grandpa say? Get rid of Nelma. We yeah. could just get so, rid so of Nelma. So that kind of woke Grandpa up, right? So, so sometimes there's things that happen that suddenly realize, oh, this isn't innocent anymore. This is serious. We've got to deal with this. So when it finally came right out into the open, 
where grandpa got it. Um, then my father w woke up, and he was between 37 and 40 years old when yeah. this when this took place, and um, it really it really shook him up. And uh, I, I remember hearing him say several times, um, "If you ever leave, I'm going with you." <laughs> and that was after it. he had learned about the leave and cleave. How can the sacred circle be broken? What, the sacred circle is a new family unit. How can it be broken? Blabbermouth, yeah. <laughs> how, how, how else can, can, can it be broken? Okay, one of the spouses is not cleaving. Yes? yes? Different ways, and somebody entering that sacred circle with, with advice or stuff, that's, that's not their business. No, the sacred no, circle. What, or to what, share what? something in that sacred circle with somebody else, that's not their business. This is our sacred circle. Now, please understand, we're talking about physical, sexual abuse, extreme stuff that goes on. There comes a time you have to break that circle and go get help. So we're not, yes, you know, absolutely. we're kind of drawing a line between those two, and I, I don't want to misunderstand that. You remember um, when they said something about the problem comes is when the spouse goes home to their parents and starts starts to talk about that. That's one of the things we talked to our boys about um, before they got married, and and. Um, Well, and, and we talk about this in, in, in the marriage um, weekends and, and when we counsel um, young people that are planning to get married, do not run home to mama or daddy about your frustrations in your marriage because if you do, you will work it out between the two of you and everything will be fine, but mom and dad will not forget. And, and then they relate to that spouse always as if they are a problem. And I think, I think that early on, um, I think early on Richard and I both were guilty of this, and I know I was. And it was something that my mom, if I, um, if I ever said anything, I was very careful um, she never forgot. Yep, they came home. To never Ruth forgot. Later. We had we we passed way on beyond, but she didn't forget. Yeah. So be careful. Don't go home to mom and daddy and and talk about your problems. This, this is more for the young people at this point, isn't it? Yeah. At what age does obedience to parents stop? What do they talk about? When you become an adult. Yes. See, obedience to parents is when you're a child. We're no longer obedient to parents once we become an adult. And certainly, now there may be some debate, well, are you an adult before you get married? Well, that's, okay, we'll leave that one alone. But certainly by the time you get married, what does God say? Leave and cleave. Yeah. And so are you still under the authority of the parent? No, you're not. You're under God's authority with a new sacred yeah. circle. Um, what were some of the... Oh. We've got about several that. more questions here. Oh, okay. Right here. A um, couple of things. The, the degree to which we leave is the degree to which we can cleave. Uh, what is the difference between honor, honor and obey? They talked about that. They talked about that, right? There is a difference. You can honor your parents without obeying them. Um, if... Yes, that's true. In the case of mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dad, in, in this situation, Dad could have said, when, when Grandpa said, you know, how to get rid of Nelma, he could have obeyed his dad and said, okay, well, let's get rid of her then. That would have been wrong. That would not have been honoring the parent. But Dad stood up. Dad stood up to Grandpa. I'm not sure. Yes. That's another... Yeah, that's yes. another big thing. Yes, if somebody if, if somebody out there comes with something, you you check in. Say, well, 
This well, is our. This is where I get my uh, information from. We have to work it out together. We'll let you know. Yeah, um, stay as a team. And that's one of the things that that we told our boys when they were um, dating their prospective wives. We would say to them, um, and and then that even after after they were married for a while, we would say, "Have you talked to Amy about this?" Yeah, we pushed well, her then, right back on then, it. Go back and talk to Amy. Don't talk about to this Don't, be talking Don't to talk us. to yeah, us talk about to this until you've talked to her. Yeah. And we did that with our other son too. Don't come to us unless you've talked to your wife first, or if you come together. Okay. Uh, here's the last question: What did mom and dad need in order to be able to put this behind them and move on in their relationship? We're going to suggest at least one of the things they needed was forgiveness. And there was a lot of forgiveness that needed to happen. And and you're going to... Yep, I am. Okay. Go to the whiteboard. And, and the question becomes... So, so Merlin's going to make a circle here of, of the people that, that were involved, at least at that time. Um, so who needed to forgive whom? We just want to... Have your response. The names are right up here. Excuse me. Yeah. Just call out. Yeah. Just. Oh oh oh. I'll try. Okay. Mom and dad. Okay. Mom and dad. Mom and dad need to forgive grandma and grandpa. Mom needed to forgive Dad. Oh, yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? Yes, Rick and Cheryl need to forgive them all. Yes. Right? Um, and and we, you were going to put Melody and your name on there also. Just kind of... Yes, underneath Richard is going to be Mel. You call it Melody. And I mean, Cheryl is, my wife calls me MK, so I'm MK. Okay, so, and, and really, uh, we're going to be included in some of this, too, because if forgiveness comes, uh, the need for forgiveness comes in a lot of different directions. Maybe that's hey, sufficient to show us. Each, each one of us had to set our boundaries with, with Grandpa at, at, at different times. Um, I was pregnant with our youngest son when when I set my boundary with my grandfather. And um, he had called me up, and he was wanting to talk about this issue between my my, my parents. And um, so I, I just told him, I said, Grandpa, this is between you and Mom and Dad, and I will not be discussing this with you. And I said that several times. You finally Grandpa, got it. <laughs> this is between you and dad and mom. Several times. I was just like a ro broken record. I said that over and over. And finally he, he, he hung up. And um, never bothered me again. Okay. You had... One of the problems was that Grandpa would call Dad at uh, 3 o'clock in the morning or, or 4 o'clock in the morning. He wasn't sleeping, so nobody else was sleeping, right? He'd also and, scream in the phone, and Dad would hold the phone out like this. You could hear him. You could hear everything he was saying. He was um, yelling so loud. See, and I don't remember that part. Oh, I do. Okay. <laughs> well, after Melody and I were married, Grandpa called me up early, early in the morning, and, and I am not an early bird. You know, Dad used to say the early bird gets the worm. Well, I figured that the worm gets the early bird. So, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so my hours were later at night that I'd go to bed, and then I'd wake up and get up 
7 o'clock or whatever in the morning. So he called me up and I said, Grandpa, I'll make you a deal. He said, I said, you don't call me until after 7 in the morning and I won't call you after 11 at night. I never had another call from him in those times. One time, this is where, I'm, where, where I was saying you need to set your boundaries early on. But what happened was that Grandpa would call and Dad would answer the phone and... and um, and just listen. And just listen. And then he'd call again and just listen. And of course, then anger's building up with, with mom over what's going on. Again, one time, I told him. Okay, is this one on? Okay. okay, it's on. All right, thank you. Hold on to that out there because I'll use this one here. So as you can see, uh, just to review here, and we could talk about each one separately, but the, the point is, when it comes to forgiveness, there's plenty of uh, need to go around, right? Yes. We all, it's amazing, we all need forgiveness, we all need to forgive other people, and we also um, hurt other I, people. I, I, I want to just underscore what Richard has already talked about just a little bit ago. Um, and and uh, we're Merlin and I are in gr a, a, agreement with this. We don't know mom's motive, but it seems to us that um, her obsession over how she had been wronged permeated, eventually ended up permeating all her other inf all of her other relationships, even including her relationships with her grandchildren. It filtered down. Yep, it did. And um, <sighs> excuse me. Yes, uh, the Not her, her father-in-law. Yes, yes. And um, there's a. Yeah, I, I'm not going to go there. Um, I just, I just want to read this. Um, it is the law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. Paul said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. By beholding, we become changed into what we dwell on. Um, what, what I decided not to say, and I'm not going to go far with this, um, I believe that my mother had a some kind of a traumatic e experience um, when she was six years old, and I'm not just I'm not going to go into that, but I I believe that 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 may have impacted. We've wondered, we've gone around and around, wondering um, what what caused this in mom's behavior, but okay. So, so I want you to a I want to ask you, what do you see? A black dot. Yeah. Okay, here. How much of this, how much percentage of this board is black and how much percentage is white? Yeah, it's awful lot of us white. But when we look at the board, our eyes are attracted to the black spot. What's wrong? Not What's wrong? on all the good that and, is surrounding it that is... And the that's, good that's going This on. is a principle by beholding we become changed. There is enough black spots around us that we can behold those. In the case of mom, she obsessed on this stuff and she became the same thing to her children and grandchildren. That was very unfortunate because she did a lot of good. I'm not saying that, but she became some of those things because she was dwelling on the black spot rather than you know, addressing it, dealing with it. Okay, it was a problem. Let's deal with it, get it beyond it. Now let's forget about that. Let's move on. 
and let's dwell on the white stuff. Let's dwell on the good things. And we all face this challenge every day. Because we are sinners. It's we're automatic the, for us to We're attracted to the dark side. We're attracted to the black spot. And so we have to say, Jesus, help me to acknowledge the black spot where I need to. And then, Lord, I want to move on and start focusing on the whiteness of Jesus, the perfection of Jesus. And he eventually can help us forget about that black spot, and it's not an issue in our life anymore. You know, Melody mentioned that um, it's not, yeah. Um, Melody mentioned um, that both of the <coughs> problem people in in her life um, eventually both of them apologized and that is evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit that is God at work the human beings ourselves we can't change but Jesus can change our hearts and praise God um, mom and Melody made peace yeah genuine peace and there was genuine love between the two of them now Marilyn and I and Richard and Melody are doing our best not to allow history to repeat itself I want to just speak for Merlin and I we are not a hundred percent successful in this yeah. right. because we're on the journey but we choose to change when we see the need and um, we've got three pieces of advice for you I want to explain a little uh, secret weapon that we uh, I actually thought of it uh, we were struggling over something that our children were doing or oh, I, I just need to undersc underscore um, remember we are we live here our oldest son lives here our youngest son lives here so we're up on the same mountain the, so we live in close feet. proximity so we know a lot of what's going on there so sometimes this we know too much stretch. sometimes we know too much okay so um, we are we are sometimes processing something and, and we're saying, you know, do we need to say something to kids about this? And, and I came up with a little expression that's what I call as boon, B-O-O-N. And that is N-O-O-B backwards. And what boon is... None of our business backwards. Yeah. So wh when we come up to something and she says, she says to me or I say to her, you know, well, we need to talk to the kids about that. We'll just say, boon. And we'll say it in unison. We boon. can see it, say it, say it so right now in we front don't of even, them sometimes, and we they don't even know what we're talking about. Yeah, we don't even have to, to mention it. We just look at each other and boon. It's, it's difficult to stay out of their business as a parent. It is. And we recognize that that's one of the things that mom struggled with because she, anyway, you, you heard the story. But what we're saying is we can choose to break the cycle. Uh, we have a policy uh, not to give unsolicited two. advice unless, unless they ask. Um, we were talking about this um, we, of, of just a couple of weeks be, uh, ago. We had some company come to our house, and we were um, talking about living there close together, and they were saying how wonderful it was, and we were saying how wonderful it is, too. But and, it is. and and we were talking to them about Boone, and um, Nathan was was sitting there, and um, he said, "We ask their advice because they don't give it unless we ask, and if we are free in our advice." Well, what you should do is this. Well, what I would recommend is do this. We're setting up ourselves, particularly with our sons. Mothers with sons are a challenge. Um, because a, a, male, um, a male 
son does not like to receive advice from his mother. Mommy, you know. From mommy. Yes, mommy. And it can, call, it can create real resentment and anger in a son, unless the advice is asked for. Mm -hmm. So that's a policy. So that's, that's our policy. The number three. Um, before the boys got married, I was very concerned about perpetuating this generational sin. And uh, truly, I agonized over it because I had seen it twice within my own family. And um, I was talking to one of my girlfriends doing the trouble talk, you know, <laughs> and telling her how concerned I was that I did not want to repeat this in the next generation. And she said, Cheryl, um, just because this, this is in, in a generational problem in your background does not mean that you are destined to repeat mm. the past. You can't, you do have you do have um, the, choice. The, the, the choice to um, stop this. And that was good news to me, although I, I knew that principle and I'd heard it, but I'd never had it applied to myself, actually, when I was right in the middle of it. Uh, um, so when the boys were planning to get married, and then after they got married, I realized that I would only be as close to my sons as I was to their wives. And if I was strained out with their wife, I would be strained out with my sons. And part of the reason for that is because the son's loyalty must be to his wife. Not, not to his, mom. his mother or his father. And so I have worked far harder on my relationship with our girls than I have with the boys. Because if I have the girls' heart, automatically I have the boys' hearts. Mm. Yeah. There's a, there's a statement here. It says, if the sins of the fathers are not dealt with, those sins will pass on to the next generation. The goal is to recognize and to choose to deal and to stop the cycle. Yeah. <clears throat> all right. There's a need to forgiveness. Not all of us face in-law issues, so we, we don't want to make this about just in-laws. What we're talking about the in-laws for the purpose of talking about forgiveness. We don't all face uh, in-law issues. All of us face probably some tension in that area, which is this reality. Uh, so we have to work it out. But um, we choose to forgive in order to get unstuck from any, any particular issues. Here's the need to forgiveness. There's a hurting, and being hurt is inevitable. Uh, why is it inevitable? The hurting and being hurt is inevitable. As we're in a mess down yeah. here. And yeah. it's just going to happen. When you've got, everybody's uh, got uh, shards and stuff around them, it's hard to diff difficult to touch somebody else without wounding them. You don't even mean to many times, but that's inevitable. We are all fallen human beings. Human love falls short. And wounding our spouse is also inevitable. And I would say in some ways, it's more likely in some ways to wound our spouse than that's somebody the out there. Closest relationship. Um, if you think of somebody, uh, name some person in the news that is over in Afghanistan or someplace like that, how much problem do you have forgiving them? Zero. You have no relationship with them. It's the ones that you have the closest relationship with that set up the need, potential need for forgiveness if there's a problem because the wounds are go much deeper with somebody that's close to you. You remember Judas? It's amazing that Jesus forgave Judas, right? You know, without, because that was a very close friend that he betrayed him. 
put him on the cross, and yet he forgave him. Somebody else wouldn't make so much difference to him, but a close friend. And then, uh, and here's a, the thing, we will be hurt by others, and they will hurt us, because that's our fallen condition. There's a struggle to forgive. There are the big wounds. Maybe they're from our childhood. Maybe from the maybe some of the big wounds are from our parents or our siblings. Maybe another family member. Maybe our spouse has been um, unfaithful. Maybe the there's physical or emotional abuse. Maybe um, there is a divorce. That's also a very deep, deep wound. Death of a spouse. And then there are the there are the repeated little wounds. The the little um, things where we are disrespectful. Subtle insults, little injustices, disrespect, the neglect of the neglect of the little kindnesses and thoughtfulness. All of these little wounds can erode away and end up being a deep festering sore. So, if you can, you, you probably had this. You probably had this experience. I have, where you. You get a, a wound on your hand, maybe a scratch. It's not a big deal. It itches, you know, or gives you trouble. So you, you put something on to heal it, and it gets a nice scab over. And then you're working away, and oh, I just ripped the scab off. And suddenly that little wound that was not that big of a deal becomes a bigger wound. He's, ouch, man, it really hurts, you know. And so you kind of fix it up. What happens if you do it a second or third or fourth time in the same one? It gets deeper and deeper and hurts more and more. That's what we're talking about, the little wounds. Mm -hmm. You know, you can kind of, okay, that's no big deal. But oh, same spot, and that's in marriage and family in particular, that's one of the challenges because it's the same spot every time because you know each other too well. And so that has to be dealt with. Feelings of repayment and retaliation and revenge are typical. It's a part of the normal human experience, but they're just that. Their feelings and feelings do not need to run our lives. I and 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 I just wanted to to mention this. Um, we can become our own perpetrators if we continue to obsess and ruminate on on the wrongs that have been done to us. Yeah. Um, we re-wound we re ourselves over and over again. And so that's one of the reasons why it's so important to make the choice to, to forgive. The, that, that way we don't become, that way we don't turn into cannibals and eat ourselves up. That actually happens sometimes. People will not forgive somebody that person dies and that person still has not forgiven and they don't forgive them even though they're dead and so they live with that the rest of their life that anger and non-forgiveness that person can do nothing about it they're gone so it, but, it can be very damaging but even if a person is is dead and gone they can still be forgiven you're, you're creating your own yes you can but i'm saying that creates your own you're wounding yourself again yes then there's a story of joseph uh, Joseph, as you know, we won't be going through this story except just give a thumbnail sketch yes. here at the beginning. Skipping along the top. Um, the story of Joseph is an amazing story of forgiveness. All right. Um, Joseph, uh, his father favored him. Listen to this, how this set up here. His father favored him. His brothers hated him. Joseph had dreams of sheaves and wheat and sun and moon and stars bowing down to him. His brothers hated him even more for that. At some point a little later on, they grabbed him. They tore off his coat, threw him in the pit, sold him to slavery. On the way to Egypt, Joseph was transformed from a petted child into a principled 
and God-fearing young man. Yes. Um, the, 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 there's there's an um, indication that um, that talks about that in the patriarchs and prophets. I don't and I don't have the I don't have the quote with me. If you'd like me to, I can find it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, whether he was a spoiled child or whether his father favored him, you know that that is, that was what basically that question was. But there is some indication that he had become a petted child uh, and um, was kind of a little bit proud of it. Uh, but um, we need to move along. Let's, let's move on and tell the rest of the story. As a result of his slavery, Joseph worked for 10 years for Potiphar. God blessed him and he came chief, became chief steward. Potiphar's wife seduced him, tore off his coat, this is the second time that his coat was torn off. Um, this time he got away. The first time he didn't. Potiphar's wife lied about him, betrayed him. Potiphar imprisoned him, and then for all practical purposes abandoned him. He was in prison. He became an o the overseer of the prison. He interpreted dreams and was forgotten. If anyone had a reason to be resentful, bitter, filled with hate, it was Joseph. Twenty years later now, Joseph is prime minister in Egypt. The ten brothers are suddenly on their faces before him. The twenty years is quite a while. And when you think of his twenty years, think of what happened twenty years ago in your life. And now it's suddenly right here in front of you. The dreams, the pain, the hurt at what his brothers had done flooded into his mind. He was thrown into a crisis, a crisis of forgiveness. He had total control over them at that point, just like they had had control, control, control over him when they threw him in the pit. He had now total control over them. What would he do with it? The test had come. And then, listen, he hears his brothers talking among themselves because he can understand their language. They don't know it. They said to one another, Surely we were being punished because of our brother. We saw his, him distressed, how distressed he was when he pleaded for his life. And we would not listen. And that's why this distress has come on us. Reuben replied, Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? But you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them and began to weep, but then turned back and spoke to them again. Can you feel the tension just crackling in that room? The guilt, and the anger, the blame, the remorse, anguish, grief, and tears. Have you ever considered uh, what God's purpose was in bringing about this reunion? What was he doing in bringing these men together after 20 years? And I, and I just want to stop for a moment here. Remember, this is 20 years. And they're in a little bit of a crisis now, a big crisis. And where do they, where do they go automatically? It was because of the sin of 20 years ago. See, they're still burdened with that thing. Otherwise, their mind wouldn't have, We're going to maybe keep... Yeah. Yes. We need to get. That's right. Yes. Yeah, sure. So we'll yes. That's that. right. After 20 years, and he, God's purpose, he brought them together. After all, God had predicted this very thing would happen in the dreams. God knew they were going to get back together. What was God doing? Listen to this. God brought the 11 brothers face to face with each other. The only ones who knew what had happened that terrible day when they had ripped his coat off, thrown him into a pit, and sold him into Egypt. God brought the big secret, the elephant in the room, into the room 
and required them to see it and acknowledge it. God tested the brothers for Joseph's sake and for his own. Those tests mirrored what Joseph himself had experienced. Through the tests, God brought conviction of the enormity of their sin against Joseph. God had Joseph listen to and witness his brother's deep remorse and anguish over what they had done to him. Listening to the brothers talk amongst themselves, Joseph saw, possibly for the first time, that he was not the only one who had suffered. They had suffered for over 20 years with soul-crushing guilt over what they had done. Listening to the brothers' anguished guilt over what they had done to him humanized them into fellow fallen sinners. This divine setup was about bringing the 11 brothers to forgiveness. To forgive and be forgiven. And bring about the possibility of reconciliation and redemption. That is what God was doing in bringing the brothers face to face. <clears throat> there are three deep hurts when it comes to forgiveness. Uh, the first one is disloyalty. Joseph was being treated like a stranger. That's what disloyalty is, being treated like a stranger. Betrayal, treated like an enemy. Joseph was treated like an enemy. He was sold, gotten rid of. He's the enemy. Brutality. Joseph experienced physical and emotional violence and was treated as less than human. Ripped his stuff off him, threw him in the pit. Regardless of whether he's a little bit of a, um, maybe a little spoiled, if we, if we say, well, maybe he's a little bit spoiled, he certainly didn't deserve that. Come on. This is just brother stuff, you know. There's, there's, no, there's no sense in that. But yet, they rip it off, throw him in the pit. He experienced this brutality and violence on himself. He had been treated so violently with such brutality by his brothers, he was faced with one of the most agonizing crises of forgiveness. If anybody faced one of those crises, it was Joseph. When you, when you listen to his whole life, Joseph's story of forgiveness and recon recon reconciliation is pretty dramatic. And it's a really good story to study when you want to study forgiveness. It's even called, as many of you know, a type of Christ. He is called a type of Christ who is a savior to his people because he forgave the horrible things done to him. Even as he's there on the cross, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And Joseph had that same spirit. He'd, he'd, he'd drunk of the same well, and he got it. And so he had that same spirit. However, there are some important facts about forgiveness that help us on this um, journey in this story as well. First of all, here's some facts about forgiveness. Forgiveness is a process. Particularly if it's a big wound. There are, for the small wounds, um, those can be forgiven quickly. In the story of Joseph, you see that it's a process. Now, maybe Joseph had forgiven in his heart before the brothers ever showed up. I don't have any much doubt about that. But there was still a process of deeper forgiveness now. And Joseph experienced that. So it's a big as a process, and there's several months to go by and so forth. Receiving forgiveness is often hard. Actually, the brothers had a hard time accepting that forgiveness. They really did. In fact, when the, when the father died and they were going to take him back to Canaan to bury him, um, then the brothers are all suddenly scared. You remember that story. That's in What's chapter Joseph going to do? Is he now going to get revenge on us because dad's dead and he was just kind of he was just kind of keeping it the lid on it until dad died and now he's going to take take it out on us? No. So they had a hard time receiving the forgiveness. Sometimes that is with all of us, and forgiveness doesn't have to be accepted to be real. Was Joseph's forgiveness real? It's very real, very real. So even though the brothers hadn't fully embraced it and accepted it, Joseph had forgiven them. Mm -hmm. Think about Jesus on that one. There are four stages of forgiveness. The first stage is when somebody causes you pain so deep and unfair that you just can't 
forget about it. And the second stage is anger. And that's um, typically right on the heels of the, of the hurt. And if the anger is not dealt with and we do not choose to forgive, then the anger turns to resentment, which turns to bitterness, which turns to hate. Then this we believe that's what is, happened with the, with the brothers, which is why they sold him. He had gone down the wrong track here. This choice is much more intractable and difficult to deal with. But if, on the other hand, um, we choose the road to forgiveness, as Joseph did, then we can move toward healing. If it is a, um, if it is a deep wound, healing will take, take um, a long time. Um, in the scripture that we, we just read where Joseph was listening to the brothers, um, then after, after that, then the brothers go back to uh, um, their home with their food for, for their families, and then Joseph goes back to work. And I think that that was a gift um, that the Lord gave them because they had at least several months for the brothers to, after they had been very much convicted um, of, of what they had done to, to Joseph, they were given a chance to process and to deepen their repentance and Joseph, as he went back to work, he had a chance to process over the next few months, and to he had a chance to process and to deepen his forgiveness. Then the third stage, we see the person who hurt us as a fellow wounded human being, which is what happened to Joseph when he listened. The sting is gone from the hurt, and we can wish them well. Joseph was able to wish his brothers well. And then the next stage is the coming together, and this is where the possibility of reconciliation can happen if there is honesty and genuine repentance. And Joseph had listened to his brothers um, and the anguish that they had gone through in the last 20 years. And he could see that there was genuine repentance on their part. One of the things I wanted to mention here is that um, forgiveness and also reconciliation does not necessarily mean that you climb back into bed with the person. Well, and as we kind of alluded to earlier, <coughs> there are situations that become unsafe for you to yes. re-enter. But Even that does not mean that you can't forgive. By yes. God's grace, you can forgive, but doesn't mean you uh, then trust that person with, with your presence anymore and you can you have can't do it because they're not a safe person even if you forgive them and reconciliation can take place in some situations not everything because uh, they're not and i i would say that there's also there are degrees to reconciliation yeah. Yeah. there are, you may not be able to have total reconciliation but you may be able to have reconciliation to a point which happened with the brothers incidentally there was reconciliation <laughs> but they still they were afraid a little bit. In the story of in the story of Joseph, God brought the eleven brothers face to face with each other to show the possibility and the power of forgiveness. Joseph forgave and was reconciled to his brothers, but their relationship was changed forever. Yeah. They no longer had power over him, but they still struggled to accept his forgiveness. All right, and then there's the freedom of forgiveness. This is uh, pretty powerful. First of all, when we forgive, it releases the other person from our condemnation. P 
part of living the abundant life is experiencing forgiveness, is giving forgiveness, because God says, I want to have you have life, and I want to have you have it more abundantly. You and I cannot have the abundant life without forgiveness of other people, because we'll be trapped by those things. In fact, actually, forgiveness, when I forgive someone, genuinely forgive them, it frees me up. It frees the forgiver. And that's really good news. So then I can have the abundant life. If you continue to hate, then you enslave yourself with your own past, by fasting yourself to the past and letting your hate become your future. That's not good. You can reverse your future only by releasing the other person from their past. Mm -hmm. And if not, then you will begin to, hate will begin to permeate not just that relationship, that all relationships you're connected with. Over a period of time, yes. Here's some, tell, tell, here's some truth-telling text we want to share. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. The word give place, the words give place there means <clears throat> um, that we don't get stuck in anger. We give it away, we give it to God. Because only God knows the whole story. Yeah. Now, that is true in the sense of what actually happened, but it's also true in the sense of what will happen from that. Only God is in this position to say, vengeance is mine, leave it alone, let me take care of this, I can do a much better job of it than you can. Because if you take vengeance on yourself, uh, for yourself, then you will end up destroying the very thing that I'm trying to create. And in the, in the, in the kingdom... If somebody who has wronged us grievously is there, we will say, praise the Lord. His vengeance is the right one. He took care of it. Whatever he did to take care of it, that vengeance is going to then fall on the shoulders of Jesus Christ at the cross. And when we really see that, that's a part of the story as well. So vengeance is mine. The next one says, um, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Just a reminder that we're all in the same boat. But God commendeth his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in the midst of putting Jesus on the cross, he is saying, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. That is a very profound forgiveness from Jesus, our Savior. Because all of us have messed up, and all of us, all of us, any one of us, have done enough sinning to put Jesus on the cross. In fact, any one of our sins was enough to put him on the cross. Do you hear me? So he that, loved us that much. He loved us that much, and he would have died if it was just one. So we, he died for the sins of the world, but he dies for my sins. And when you really see that, he commended his love for us while we were yet sinners, while we were in the very act of sinning. He says, my forgiveness is there for you. And that's the only reason why Adam and Eve could continue to live, because God immediately su supplied a future forgiveness for them. Then there's a, there's a promise for us. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Well, that's not the promise yet, but it's, it's also a promise in a way. Um, so I want to uh, remind us of a um, story, a uh, parable that Jesus told. This parable is, is found in Matthew chapter 18. You are probably familiar with this parable. And it starts with verse 23. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'm just going to read a little bit of it here. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened to a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought into him which owed him 10,000 talents. Now you remember the rest of the story. And we'll just kind of flip down to a little bit later on. But you remember the rest of the story where this person was forgiven the 10,000 talent, which let's just say it was millions and millions of dollars. It was a huge sum, which he had no 
ability to repay. And then his brother came up to him, which owed him a few pennies, and he threw him in prison, even though he said his fellow servants fell down at his feet, besought him, saying, verse 29, have patience with me, I will pay all. But he would not and cast him into prison. So then what happened to this young man or this person? Verse, pardon? Yeah, his fellow servants ratted him out. Uh, verse 33 then, the, 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 the king is saying to this guy, shouldest not thou also have had compassion, i.e. forgiveness, on thy fellow servant as I had pity, compassion on you? <clears throat> there are any number of things that we will be wounded with. We all have things that we need to forgive from time to time. Maybe there's things in your heart right now that are brewing, that you're angry at somebody, something, somebody did something to you. Or hurt. Hurt you. The only way to get over that is to go back and think about what you have been forgiven. The, the, the amount, the... The amount of your forgiveness is so much greater than you could ever offer to somebody else. What we've been forgiven. That's the basis to be able to forgive somebody else. It comes back to Jesus and the cross. And we can only give what we receive. There is sometimes um, in, in countries that, where they've had genocides and so forth, they have later on, they'll have a, a truth and reconciliation an effort to try to bring the people back together and kind of put things behind them. And that's okay, but I'm just, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to be very frank with you, genuine forgiveness, genuine forgiveness can only take place in the Christian context. It can only take place when we have sensed and know our forgiveness that to us that we're able to pass that on to somebody else. It's not just a matter of, oh, well, I'll just forget about it and, and we'll just go on. That may be somewhat forgiveness, but the only genuine article is when we receive it from the God of the universe and he died for us in that cross. And when we sense that in our deep inside, we can't but help pass that on to somebody else. And if we refuse to pass it on, it's like damming up a stream the, the water of life flowing through us and forgiving us and cleaning us, and we dam it up. What's going to happen? Our life is going to get polluted. The only way is to open that dam up and let that water flow through us, forgiving us and then forgiving them. That's the basis of forgiveness. This is the promise we want to share today. Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world um, forgiveness it is not possible it is impossible for us to genuinely forgive somebody unless Jesus comes into our heart and shows us his love and then we pass it on it's impossible this is not a human possibility this is a divine act that God does for us and in us. And I just praise his name for that. And that's why the Bible says, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ also forgave you. Let's, um, let's have prayer and then if there's any questions. Kind Heavenly Father, I just want to thank you for your amazing grace to us and your love and goodness. Please, Father, help us to not just intellectually sense your forgiveness, yes. but to accept it and acknowledge it down in the depths of our heart. Yes. And then, Father, Forgive others through us, because that is what you love doing. And then take us to your kingdom, a whole bunch of forgiven sinners, mm -hmm. praising you forever in Jesus' name.